I am one of Didima Shivani's disciples, Sadak Devashish. I will be reading a few parts written by Didima in this video as well. Ma and Dadaji were masters who stood among those who have risen to the highest rung of spirituality. As such, they both formed their code of spiritual ethics to always be 100% authentic and invulnerable. Any falsehoods or made easy versions of divine yoga suggested by their many well-wishers so that they may gather a greater renown or following could not touch them. At any such proposal, they balked at it instantly. Delusion of any kind, which often seems to be a norm in today's world, was totally unacceptable to them. Pointing towards some such suggestions, once Ma had observed, How in the world could I act on such advice? When at night I go to see him, meaning her beloved Sri Krishna, how could I look into his eyes after committing such an atrocity? Be it nighttime during her meditations, or daytime amongst the coming and goings of people, Ma Indra Devi Ji's devotion to Sri Krishna was so great, his physical form was visible to her often. Even with such deep love, Ma used to get anxious to have his darshan, that is, to stand in his holy presence, and Gopal too couldn't stay away from her for long. Ma would cook delicious offerings and place it in front of Sri Krishna in her temple. Whenever she offered it to him herself, he used to partake of it. There are instances where he would even leave the imprints of his fingers in her offered food. This and some of the indications that she would record in the form of developed photographs as proof of these mysterious interactions. This practice is known as Sagarna Puja, or the worship of divine in a form. When speaking about this very subject just a few days ago, someone objected to such an occurrence, questioning how is it possible for the supreme, that eternal, infinite formless spirit to be contained and assume such an infinitesimally small form. What is so difficult about it? I asked a counter question. Sri Ramakrishna has put it so well. If boundless billowing sea depicts the formless divine, then swimming icebergs in it surely are indicative of the same water in solid form. What intrinsic difference is then between water and ice. There is none if you were to experience in deep meditation that you, your guru, or your chosen deity, Sri Krishna, Kali, Shiva, etc., and the formless divine become one, and you find yourself everywhere simultaneously. It is wonderful to get this knowledge by identity. For centuries, Indians have been portrayed as hopeless idolaters, have been maligned and laughed at by many a culture and religion. In their short-sightedness, such people don't understand that the infinitely deep and loving connection that we share with God is very personal and intimate. In our culture, some of us look upon God as a father or as a mother under whose protection one is always safe. For others, he or she is a friend one relies upon, and again for some he is all in all, mother, father, friend, lover, and a companion rolled into one. The greater the depth in the relationship increases, the more joy and bliss the devotee feels at all times. The surrender to divine increases by each passing day. Believe it or not, the Supreme too plays his part quite well. He reciprocates, enjoys the unselfish love offered to him, plays with his devotee as a human, and as a consequence, the bliss of love, indescribable love, makes his devotee forever engaged. Sri Krishna has mentioned it in the Gita. All are equally dear to me, but those who look at me, I look at them too. The kind of relationship one develops with Divine is very important. One devotee says to him, Yes, 
I do look at you, but don't forget to fulfill my desires as it is my birthright. The Great One does not answer, though now and then does glance at such a person to see if he has developed enough to have pure love yet or not. The second exclaims, If I don't ask you to grant me my wishes, who should I then ask? Still, Divine remains silent. Oh, how well he understands the human mental that always defends all its actions like an attorney. The third one is like Sufi Rumi. Says he, One went to the door of the beloved and knocked. A voice asked, Who is there? He answered, It is I. The voice said, There is no room for me and thee. The door was shut. After a year of solitude and contemplation, he returned and knocked. A voice from within asked, Who is there? The man said, It is thee. The door was opened for him. For as long as the ego reigns and one's relationship with divine is more or less like that of a shopkeeper or quid pro quo, the door of his personal quarters may never open for you. While you may roam about in his city, enjoying yourself and asking for whatever you like or want, and though it may not come your way, his personal space remains out of reach for you. The only gift to divine from us is the offering of pure love, which may happen to those who have discarded their ego, are fully surrendered, and demand nothing but the opportunity to love him forevermore. Ma Indra Devi Ji was one such lover of divine. At times, Sri Krishna would ask her to express her desire to him. She would always answer, Asylum at your feet, Gopal. That's what I desire for now and ever. He used to smile and nod his head in acceptance. It is people like her who make divine permanently their own. There is a lovely song of Ma's rendered beautifully by Tadaji. Just a few lines from it. Oh, my confidant, let me tell you the kind of beloved I have found. The sages and the yogis who pine for just a glimpse of him I, a feeble woman, has won him over. I knew only of one mantra, one tantra, and one method. All virtuous beings called him by the name of God, but I looked upon him as my very own. In whose pursuit the renunciates travel from jungle to jungle, he on his own accord, came to my house. The sages and the yogis, who pine for just a glimpse of the one, I, a feeble woman, has won him over. The sages and the yogis, who pine for just a glimpse of the one, I, a feeble woman, has won him over. One evening, after the program in the temple hall, when Ma arrived upstairs, one of her hands remained closed, as if she was carrying something in her fist. After taking her seat, she slowly opened her palm and showed us some sweet prasad, holy food, stashed in it, and said, Tonight, he arrived while nibbling on this, and then left the rest in my hand. We were all speechless with awed wonder. Then she called one of her disciples by his name, gave him some prasad and said, Eat it. It is the leftover of Krishna. Next she called me forward. I received the prasad with great respect and while eating it, I felt grateful for being included in this extraordinary incident as I was not even her disciple. All I could think was, 
How gracious is she? Gurus usually reserve such rites only for their own disciples. After the evening soiree of beautiful spiritual music, I had just walked out of the temple hall when an older woman stopped me. I found her curious because she used to wear sunglasses even after sundown. In the mornings, she would occasionally go upstairs with the rest of us, but after the evening chants and prayers, she would depart for her apartment nearby, where she lived with her husband. I noticed when she felt physically indisposed or couldn't do the cooking at home for any reason, she would request the ashram to send some food for them. She introduced herself by saying, I have known Ma from yore. If you like, you may consider me one of her relatives. My name is S. In the past, I didn't believe in this stuff of spirituality. Our lives were so externalized. We frequented clubs and such places. She paused, then continued. I was an avid smoker too. It took me quite some time to get over such things. As I listened politely, I was wondering, why was she telling me her history without any provocation from me? I wanted to go up and be in the presence of Ma. She must have sensed my reluctance of continuing this chat as she said further, you must be thinking, why am I telling you all this? I made no answer. She continued, because I have heard what Ma has said about you. I was curious to find out about it, but did not ask her to reveal it to me. In this way, she would stop me often in the evenings to relate her stories. It used to make me late at times for being in Ma's presence. And when Ma glanced at me quizzically, I always had to say, Ma, Auntie has stopped me again. One evening, in answer to Ma's glance, I had something to report. It is an interesting story I heard today, Ma. Auntie S. was talking about the time when she wanted to install Gopal on her shrine at home. It was distressing for her to see that you would grant your permission to so many for this blessing. But whenever she wanted the same for herself, you'd always say, No, not yet. Ma smiled broadly, and she said, Yes, this did happen. Next day, in the morning, when Auntie S. arrived upstairs, I overheard Ma bantering with her. So, you were relating your story to her about wanting to install Gopal in your home temple? She came up and planted herself in front of Ma and began her mock complaint, saying, Yes, you wouldn't permit me to have one, Ma. Ma picked up the thread of the story in her hands and said, When people want to create a private temple of their own, they bring an idol of Gopal. Since he likes to be presented well, I always put a lovely crown on his head a bit of color in his eyes and on his lips. Then they install him in their temple and continue the worship and meditation in front of their shrine. Each time S asked me, I had to ask her to wait, as Sri Krishna had told me he was not ready to go to her home yet. One day, she importuned relentlessly, so I said, Very well, you may try. Let's see what happens. She brought her own idol, and as always, I dressed him in lovely clothes, colors, and crowned him. However, the next day, she arrived early in the morning with Gopal's idol in hand, narrating how he had thrown away his crown, clothes, and all during the night. Really? I asked with great amazement. Yes, Auntie S. answered. I had to leave my Gopal with Ma here in the ashram. A couple of years down the road, I tried it again with the same consequences. A few weeks after this interaction, a woman whose husband enjoyed an exalted rank in the Indian Army visited Pune during my first trip there. She had taken it for granted that Ma was there only for her and her stories. 
she wouldn't let anyone interact with Ma for a time and would always intervene with her input then would continue with her narratives. I marveled at Ma's patience. But this attitude she reserved only for the outsiders. Any one of her own disciples, for one thing, would never be so discourteous. Secondly, if someone living in the ashram would even so much as think about behaving like this, they would be silenced immediately. This is how Sadhgurus work with their own. And perhaps that's why it is always suggested to never evaluate any guru's system of grooming a disciple. One day, the military woman stepped out of the ashram to conduct some business of her own elsewhere. Ma got up from her seat as she addressed me. There seems to be no opportunity to talk with you. Come with me. She took my hand and led me to the dining room. She sat down in the chair meant for her and beckoned me toward a nearby wooden futon to sit by her. As we began to talk, I answered her questions succinctly and then dilated on a true incident that was like a thorn constantly pricking me at my side. Ma, on that fateful evening, as I finished my nightly meditation, I got into bed and must have just gone to sleep when my psychic being started to wake me up by saying, Get up, get up now. There was a distinct urgency in its tone. Sit up on your bed. Your life is in danger. You are going to be attacked. Laying in bed, I was still half asleep and tried to get up, but before I could sit up fully, I saw something much darker than the dark of the room, standing about 12 inches long, sort of a humanoid, moving at great velocity, rushing toward me from the ceiling. It hit me right in the region of the heart, and I fell back in my bed by its impact. I think I must have lost consciousness for some time, because when I came to, I heard my psychic being repeatedly asking me to wake up, wake up now, don't stay in the supine position, get up, get up, otherwise you might lose your life. With effort, I sat up and tried to turn on the lamp by the bed, but couldn't see anything in dark. I touched my eyes and knew they were open. I was sure that I had turned on the light, and yet I was in the pitch dark. I thought my vision has been compromised, but then the psychic spoke again. Don't be afraid. Let not anything scare you right now. People often die of fear. I am with you. Let not any fear enter into you. I felt totally numb. My mind, my common sense, my entire being felt as if it was put on hold. I sat in this state for some time, eyes covered over by my hands. The psychic said, You have ingested a great poison and it couldn't do anything to you. Still do not go to sleep yet. Stay awake, get up and walk around, make your body move. I did not fall asleep, but could not manage to get up and move around. A strange stupor had taken hold of my being. After some time, I had started to try to understand what just had taken place. I then slowly removed my hands from my eyes and I could see again. The table lamp was on, the room was lit, and I began to feel a bit better about the whole drama. Ma instantly understood this whole situation. She herself had to deal with some black magic at some point in her life too. More details in Pilgrims of the Stars. We continued to talk, and out of the blue, she suggested to me, go to Denver, live there. As if she could read my mind, consolingly she said, You probably are thinking, how is it going to help me to go to Denver with this situation? I remained silent. She continued, 
Just go and see for yourself. All will be well there. Jima, I answered. She was absolutely right. As soon as I arrived in Denver, I felt as if an attack-proof armor was around me, which no one could breach. The flow of life resumed its course again, and ever since I have lived in Colorado. Sometimes I feel as if this body was created by the dust of Colorado, and finally it has found its home. All this happened by the extreme grace of Ma. Once she had said, I shall speak through your fourth body. To this day, I may not know exactly what it meant, but I am glad to realize that in any event, she will be with me, within me, always. Oh.